Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Mindset and Muscle podcast. I'm your host, Keshi. And today we're going to unravel some common yet often misunderstood terms in the fitness industry. So that is part of our Fitness 101 series. I don't know if I mentioned in the two previous episodes that we are doing, or actually maybe the last episode, that we are doing a nutrition series or a nutrition 101 series, basics of nutrition, and a fitness 101 basics of fitness series on this podcast. So we're maybe going to go back and forth between them. They might not be kind of all the episodes in that series, one after the other, but I thought that it would be helpful to kind of categorize it so that you can always just type in fitness 101 series or something like that and have access to all of them there. So yeah, that's going to be episode two in this series or episode 20 in the Mindset and Muscle podcast. So about today, whether you're a new gym goer or a gym newcomer, I guess, or you've been working out a while, understanding these terms is essential for your fitness journey. So let's jump right in. Let's start with a fundamental term, volume. In fitness, volume isn't about the level of music. (laughs) It's about the total amount of exercise you do. Specifically, it's the number of repetitions or reps multiplied by the number of sets for a given exercise. So we're not going to go that deep into why volume is that important in this episode, just because it's more so about the different terms and, and what they mean. But you'll hear me talk about volume a lot more, that's for sure. (laughs) Now, I talked about reps and sets. So what is a rep and what is a set? So a rep, which is a short form for repetition, is one complete motion of an exercise. For example, one push-up or one squat would be one repetition. Now, a set is a group of consecutive reps. For example... Doing 10 push-ups in a row will be considered one set of 10 reps. Or doing 8 squats in a row would be considered one set of 8 reps. So the number of reps and sets you do can vary greatly and will vary greatly depending on your goals, whether that's to build strength, endurance, or muscle. And you might find yourself ranging quite a bit in, in that rep range. Or, yeah. That's, that's another term, I guess, that we use. Like, for example, you could be doing five times five, which is five sets of five reps, or four times eight, or three times 10, or three times 12. Those are very common rep ranges, and you might find yourself kind of um, either sticking to a couple of them or varying quite a bit, depending on your goals again. So now what is, let's talk about an RM or a rep max. So a one RM, for example, a one rep max. So (laughs) how do I start this? An RM is a way to measure the maximum amount of weight you can lift for a specific number of repetitions. So a one RM or one rep max would be the maximum amount of weight you can lift for one rep. So if your one RM for squats is 200 pounds, it means that the heaviest weight you can squat for one rep is 200 pounds. Now let's talk about RPE and RIR. RPE is the rate of perceived exertion. An RPE is a way to measure the intensity of your exercise based on how hard you feel you're working. It's usually on a scale of one to 10. And then on the other hand, we have reps in reserve or reserve, sorry. RIR. RIR is another subjective measure that estimates how many more reps you could do before reaching failure. For instance, if you finish a set with an RIR of two, (laughs) why am I having trouble saying that? RIR. You're saying that you could have done two more reps if you pushed to your limit. So if there was a gun to your head and you had to do something and you, until you stop at an RIR of two, let's just say. You could have done more than those two reps after. So again, reps in reserve, if you only have two left, 
you only have two reps that you could do. So then the rate of perceived exertion would be an eight because on a scale of one to 10, it would be an eight then. I hope that makes sense. Now a term that you might very well know, HIT or high intensity interval training. HIT is a training technique involving intense bursts of high energy exercise followed by a varied period of low intensity active rest or complete rest. So basically you do maybe 30 seconds or 20 seconds of really high intensity or high energy something, maybe you're doing burpees or something for 20 or 30 seconds or sprinting. And then you have maybe another 30 seconds where you're either doing something low activity. So instead of sprinting, you could be walking or maybe you're completely resting. Next term is a superset. I feel like I should have organized this more and put all the weightlifting terms on one end, but that's okay, it's too late now. But a superset involves performing two exercises back to back with no rest in between. So usually you would do one set of something and then rest, do another set, rest, another set, and then you move on to another exercise. Or you could do a superset where you do a set of something for example, you do um, a set of like bicep curl or something. And then immediately after, instead of resting, you go into like tricep, like the rope pull down or something, something for your triceps. So that would be a super set. You're performing two exercises back to back with no rest in between. So that's a super set is often used to increase workout intensity, or I guess if you, some people use it to save time as well. I don't particularly like supersets to be honest, but that's a term that it's good is good to know. Something that I should probably have mentioned before is compound exercises. So compound exercises are exercises that work multiple muscle groups at the same time. That would be your squats, your deadlifts, your bench press. So a squat doesn't just work your quads, it also works your glutes, it also works like a lot of your body deadlifts also a lot of your body. So some compound exercises are going to work a lot of your lower body, some a lot of your upper body, or some could work like a deadlift works both lower body and upper body quite a bit. So it, it's, it, it varies a lot depending on what it is. For example, a bench would work not only your chest, but also like some of your triceps or like different parts of your upper body, but it's all compound exercises. On the other hand, we have, for example, a bicep curl or a tricep extension. Those are isolation exercises and those target a single muscle group, a specific muscle group. So usually we would start with the compound exercises. They also tend to be the most fatiguing and harder to recover from. And then we move on to the isolation work. A term that you might come across is plyometrics or plyos, or yeah, maybe <laughs> you'd find that. Those are high intensity exercises that involve explosive movements. So those would be your jump squats or your box jumps, and they're usually designed to increase power, increase speed, and, and yeah, explosiveness, I guess. I'm also not into this type of training, but just in case you were, and you wanted to know more about what it is. DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. This is the pain, the soreness that you feel in the days after a new workout or a difficult workout. So when it, whenever you feel really sore after a workout or a little bit sore, that's DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. We talked about that term before, but macronutrients or macros are the three primary types of nutrients used for energy. So we have carbs or carbohydrates, proteins and fats. The next term is functional training. Functional training involves exercises that train your muscles to work together and prepare them for daily tasks, basically by simulating common movements you might do at home, at work, or in sports. So I don't have too much experience in functional training, but they would involve kind of similar motions that you would do on a day-to-day, -day, for example, maybe carrying 
grocery bags it might be similar to like farmers carry or something i'm not entirely sure what goes into functional training per se again i'm not really into that but the point of it is to really simulate common movements that you do on a day-to-day -day basis circuit training is another term that you might hear being tossed around so that's a form of body conditioning or resistance training using high intensity aerobics usually so it targets strength building and muscular endurance through a series of different exercises but usually it's not like super heavy weights it's kind of both you're doing there's some weights involved but also it's pretty high intensity now a term that's very important again is progressive overload that's the gradual increase of stress placed upon the body during exercise while you're training so you can so that's basically just like progressing in the gym and there's different ways you can progressive overload by increasing the weight maybe by increasing the reps that you do for example if i'm going from 100 pounds for my squats and i'm going to 110 pounds or 105 pounds or whatever that's progressive overload or instead of doing eight reps if i'm able now to do 10 reps of the 100 pounds that that's also progressive overload or even the intensity of exercises for example another way that you might not think about to progressive overload is to slow down the movement and focus on tempo so usually if you rush with through something it might actually be easier to kind of use momentum to get the work done but if you slow down that increases the time under tension so time under tension is basically what it means the time that your muscle is under tension or another way of saying it is the time that your muscle is contracting while you're doing an exercise so instead of doing oh what can i think about instead of doing something again let's talk about a, a squat let's just say <laughs> if instead of doing it re really fast and your time under tension maybe being two seconds if you do it slower and your time under tension is like maybe four seconds, that's going to be harder. That's going to be progressive overload. Now, actually something that you might already know, but maybe you want a little bit of a definition of what it really is and what it involves. Maybe we'll talk about a warm up and cool down. So a warm up is an, so it's very important to warm up, but it, what it includes is like a pre exercise routine, which involves light, less intense activities that gradually increase your heart rate and blood flow to your muscles. So that's the primary goal. The goals of a warm up are to prepare the body for more strenuous activities, reduce the risk of injury and, and enhance performance. So you really, you're trying to get the blood flow to the muscles and to increase the heart rate so that the body is more adapted for those strenuous activities or prepared for it you're less likely to get injured and you're more likely to perform better. So some examples include light jogging, some dynamic uh, type of stretching. Um, again, I would recommend the dynamic type of stretching and not like the more passive one that you're holding for a warm up. Or uh, maybe movements that are even sim like very similar to the main workout, but instead of squatting, going straight into squatting 100 pounds, or 200 pounds or whatever you start lighter or maybe you start with a body weight squat or a couple of body weight squats or if you're used to lifting a lot you can start with adding like i don't know maybe like nine you can warm up with like 95 pounds if you will eventually go to 200 pounds or something like that so a warm-up is usually between like 5 to 15 minutes i would say and it's both kind of a physical preparation and a mental one <laughs> so it it improves not only um like the blood flow like we said but it also improves flexibility and range of motion when you're doing something so make sure you warm up before you start on the other hand a cool down is a period of low intensity exercise after a more intense workout session so that's an after and the purpose of this is to allow the body to gradually return to its resting state where your heart rate is no longer that elevated as it was when you were working out a spotter is a term that you might want to know. A spotter is somebody 
who supports another person during a particularly challenging exercise. So that's not necessarily a mental support. It could be a physical support. Usually it's used for physical support. So that would happen in usually weightlifting. And the point of that is to promote safety and to prevent injury. So now you might ask, like, why is, like, how is somebody else going to help me? For example, in bench, it happens a lot that you need a spotter. If you're trying to bench close to failure, what happens? How do you kind of know when you reach failure? Well, you're not going to be able to lift that weight. And then what happens when you're not able to lift that weight? Well, it's going to drop on you. So a spotter is going to be here. If that happens, if you're reaching failure, you can't lift that bar up. So they're going to be the person who is like standing behind and who's going to help you lift that bar up on that last rep. Or again, if you're squatting and you're squatting close to failure and that, that last rep, you're not able to come up. Well, they can help you. They can either um, lift the bar off you or maybe just usually what we need is not somebody who's able to lift the whole bar it's really we need a little bit of a push so they might just just give you that support and you both are basically lifting that weight together on that last rep but yeah that's a little bit too detailed of what i explained but you get the idea of what a spotter is and then that's the person but you would the, the verb is to spot somebody Somebody can ask you to be their spotter and spot them at bench, for example. Another term is an AMRAP. An AMRAP, A-M-R-A-P, means as many reps as possible. So a workout structure where you perform as many reps or as many rounds of a series of exercises as possible is an AMRAP. And that's within a, a set time frame. For example, again, let's take bench. I want to do an AMRAP at bench, so I'm going to load up the bar and then I'm going to just start lifting. One, two, three, four. I'm not going to stop at five or at ten. I'm going to stop where I can't lift the bar anymore. So I'm going to do it, do as much or as many reps as I can. And then my AMRAP might be, I don't know, maybe eight for that weight. So that's as many reps as possible. We usually do that just from time to time. I'm not sure how many people just have AMRAPs on a consistent basi basis on their program, but maybe some people do. I usually have phases where I have AMRAPs because it is a good indication sometimes of how far somebody was stopping from failure. For example, if somebody was always benching just a bar, but then they got eight, it seems so easy for them to get eight and then 10, then their coach might be, um, well, how many can you even do with the bar? Let's try an AMRAP. And then they do it and they get like 25. And we realize that they have been lifting way too light. If they can get 25 reps, they should have increased the weight <laughs> long before. So that's kind of an example. I know once I was benching and my AMRAP was like 20 or something or 17. I don't know. And I was powerlifting. Um, so then... Yeah, he was like, that's way too much. He was expecting something along 10 because we reduced the weight a little bit for the MRAP. Obviously, we're not trying that on a 1RM, but it was still like a lot. I think I got like 21. <laughs> so then that's a good indication of how, like when we can or where we can put the weight next time. The last term I have is a drop set. A drop set is... A strength training technique where you can perform a set of an exercise until failure at a certain weight then you reduce the weight and you continue to lift for more reps again until failure etc etc i'm gonna use what can i use as an example i'm gonna use a hip thrust for example although that would be rather difficult to do it but let's just say you're doing a hip thrust and you have people changing your weights quickly so I'm going to start at like 200 pounds, let's just say, and then I can get eight reps. I drop the weight and then or some somebody else is going to drop the weight because that should happen pretty quickly. Um, so then we, we remove instead of 200 pounds. Now we drop it to like 150 and I keep going. I'm not resting. Usually don't. I'm only really resting for that time it takes to remove that weight from the bar. But I'm still there. I'm still sitting there. And then I go back immediately. Nine rep 
10 rep, 11 rep. Maybe I can get three more. Okay, drop again. Now we go to 100 pounds. We try again. So I keep going until failure, until there's until I can't go anymore or until there's no more left, I guess. But then it would really be until failure. So, or you can just have like a drop set where you're removing it like three times or something. But yeah, that would be a drop set. Uh, I also don't see that happening all the time in people's training. They usually have maybe a phase or two or they have an exercise or two where they do drop sets. But I haven't really come across anybody who does everything as a drop set all the time. <laughs> Um, and a lot of exercises are also difficult to do as drop sets if you're on your own. Again, like a hip thrust, I wouldn't really be able to do that on my own because I have to like get up from there and then remove the weight from one side, remove it from the other. Like it's, you know, some other, is exi some other exercises are better. I Maybe I should have used the example of like a machine. For example, doing leg extensions would be a good one because then you could just adjust the pin on the machine. And that would actually have been an easier, a, um, a better example for this. But that's it. So that's the different terms, the fitness jargon that we talked about today. As we wrap up today's episode, remember, understanding these terms is more than just fitness trivia, let's just say. It's about, I would say, even empowering you with knowledge so that you can make informed decisions about your workouts and when you're learning on your own when you're trying to learn more or maybe you're watching YouTube videos and things like that you're not intimidated by those terms but also you know what they are so you can use them to incorporate maybe in your own workouts so stay tuned for more episodes where we'll continue to explore I guess the both the mindset and muscle aspect of life <laughs> so once again if you like this episode please give me a five-star review. And if you would like to work with me for nutrition coaching, I have the link in the show notes as well. So if you want to get started in January, reach out now. We can book a call, a free call, for a free consultation call, and then hop on for the new year. So yeah, once again, thank you very much for listening. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.